Aquinox is a fascinating piece of gaming apocrypha. Not that it's lost media or anything, you can absolutely find it on Steam, but it's one of those low triple digit review count games that most people wouldn't ever even think to look for. It was released in the year of our Lord 2001, a few months after the very bad thing happened. I found the game at a time in my life where I was on something of a submarine kick, and it definitely left an impression, even all these years later. Notably, the game was produced in Germany, as was its prequel and first sequel. So Aquinox is a Six Degrees of Freedom game, which, seeing as that's been basically a dead genre since a few days after the term was coined, probably warrants some explanation. Unlike, say, your early first-person shooter games, with a Six Degrees of Freedom game you can move not just forward and back, left and right, but also up and down, hence the Six Degrees. In this case, fighting in quick single-person combat submarines. From a technical perspective, Aquinox is something of a graphical marvel. It was marketed on its graphics, and you know what? For my money, they hold up unfathomably well for a game multiple decades old, looking like what other games of this period only achieve with an HD remaster. It even supported my modern monitor resolution natively which is something many, many games from this generation cannot say. Now these things are cool and all, but what really elevates Aquanox to being worth talking about is the world of Aqua. So named because the Earth that we know and love was ravaged by nuclear war and pollution, the surface world rendered utterly uninhabitable, leaving the only survivors in vast underwater mining complexes. Hence, it became Aqua. And unlike some of the drier post-apocalyptic settings out there, Aquinox is positively dripping with personality. As one might expect of a far future society forced to live in habitats on the ocean floor, things are rather dystopian. A cyberpunk 2077 leagues under the sea, if you will. All the usual suspects are here. Corporate greed. Damn, those Antrox people are a rotten lot. Cargo before customers? I wonder if some of that cargo isn't more than a little bit illegal. A bizarre future religion. The Adesians fear, terror, horror, and darkness. Wow, that's not your usual kind of salvation. Drugs. Blackwater! Euphorine! Endorphin booster, anti h &S pills, equilibrium from the Shogunate, brain shots, blue eyes, the drop into your eyes, potency boosters, intelligence boosters, gene server amplifiers here, cyber lollies, nicotine lollies, high pressure smokes, cortex stimulators for sight, touch, hearing, smell. What's that, a list of the stuff you just took? Anti-sleeping pills, suicide gas, only 12 credits for one balloon, Ilionox speedsters, blue brain, ketamine, gleaming psilocybin, dream fish glands, challenger and enemy secretion. Future slang. Light, you are my new assistant. Yet even beyond these typical cyberpunk tropes, there are also terror yuppies, one of the first types of enemies you encounter. These people so disconnected and bored with their posh lives in Neopolis, the wealthiest city in Aqua, they go forth and commit random acts of violence for kicks. Needless to say, this probably hit pretty different in the immediate wake of the very bad thing. Definitely one of the more striking dystopian elements. This is also to say that a good bit of the world building has some real interesting class character to it, and not just in the usual video game window dressing way either. For example, I'm pretty sure I can count on one hand the number of games where I've seen the word privatization used. There's also a real sense of place conveyed in the attitudes of all the different people you talk to all across Aqua. One of the big bads being an upstart technocrat politician feels oddly contemporary for a game over 20 years old. Perhaps this says something about Germany's political discourse being far more advanced than the ideologically confused yammering that comprises our American political discourse. But I promised myself this would be a game video first and foremost, so I'll leave it at that. Anyway, the real stars of Aquinox are its many characters, whom you get to know in these between-mission conversations, as well as chatter in the missions themselves. Now, many reviewers, both contemporarily and in the olden days, have criticized the voice acting, 
And this is not exactly unwarranted. Right! And oxygen simply stands for breathing gases in general. Because pure oxygen would be poison at the pressures we live under. That's why we need better air, and why that super gas is worth billions of credits. But to call the voice acting categorically bad does a disservice to a great many performances from voice actors who very clearly gave it their all. These performances bring a wonderfully manic energy to the game that, frankly, I think contemporary gaming could use more of. They don't just chew the scenery, they goddamn devour it. For example, meet Adawalfa Jones. Dude! <laughs> it's so wet here. I love Androx. The techno gothic hype. Everything's so wet. The next big bang in civilization. Whoa! Is going to happen right here. <laughs> Jones here might be one of my favorite performances in anything ever, bringing the same kind of joy every time I encountered him as the horrific necktie from Disco Elysium. You and I are going to dance in the moonlight under a billion stars. With about the same sensibilities. The pressure never let up. We never slept. We could do it too because we developed a stimulant called Turbo Speed. And do you want to know the wildest part? According to IMDB, his voice actor may have only one voice acting credit, but his other credits indicate he is a professional sound designer. One who worked on some real big names too, such as Fallout 1 and 2, as well as Descent 1 and 2, one of the most notable Six Degrees of Freedom games, which is probably how he made his way to Aquinox. Also, he did the music from Mario Teach's Typing. Given his level of experience with sound in games, I really wish he had helped them mix the audio better. As you've probably noticed, all the conversations have not only loud ambient background noise, but submarines noisily passing by. Light. We're debating the pros and cons of the various communication systems. You know, fiberglass, synapses, ELF. Had the ambience been turned down a few nudges, it would have been a real effective way to add yet more character to the world, but as it stands, you can barely hear a solid fourth of all conversations. Why didn't you help them with their audio mixing, Atahualpa? Why? When you have breakfast with the devil, you need a strong spoon. Ah, hell, I can't stay mad at you. All that said, Atahualpa Jones isn't the main character of Aquinox. Although that would be an absolutely amazing idea for a sequel hook, if you ask me. No, the main character is Emerald Deadeye Flint. So named because he was the result of a genetic experiment which yielded him and his sisters, Opal and Ruby, which I think makes him part of the Crystal Gems. Everyone in the game calls him Flint, though. Flint is a mercenary, traipsing through Aqua solving problems with underwater violence but his real passion is chauvinistically hitting on every single woman in Aqua. How about you just sit on my lap and keep me calm? See, now you're not all that sultry, but I still wouldn't mind a little special treatment when this place closes. Anytime, surf-born Venus. As long as we get permission for DNA reproduction. Well, keep talking, baby. It turns me on. Flint, if you were the last man in Aqua, I wouldn't go that way. How may I help you, sir? How about two out of three falls in my bathtub? Yeah, maybe. He's pretty sexist. Flint is a lot. Certainly more of a character than many brown haired white dude protagonists from that generation's games, I'll give him that. His voice actor did a pretty good job with what he was working with, too. Whoever created the power plant world of Entrox must have had a large and voracious brain with an extra gland devoted to hellish madness. Under the Entrox turbine facilities, you can feel the crushing threat of extinction more than anywhere in Aqua. Our feeble-minded ancestors located their most highly developed launch site here, eager to conquer what they called the heavens at any cost. 
All around me on the seabed were the twisted remains of their idiotic efforts, testifying instead that they ended up down here in hell. Flint does not work alone, however. First and foremost is his ship's computer, Sally. Our Neapolite hobby terrorist is on Synthahol, obviously a student of architecture. He constructively criticizes Da Gama. He's honed in the sights on his weapon systems. Looks like he's getting ready to dance. Sally is basically Fatima from Anachronox. Wait, shit, nobody's gonna get that. Uh, I mean, Cortana. She, she slints Cortana. Yeah, that's the ticket. Sally, while only speaking in missions, delivers a vibrant and energetic performance. I hope you don't expect me to warn him. A far better fake AI voice than some I've heard recently, to boot. Now, aside from Sally, Flint has a Star Fox-style team of wingmates. These wings, while they all functionally act more or less the same in combat, have some rather colorful personalities. Now, I have to start with Lieutenant Boston Harper, or as his friends call him, Dopamine Harp. Hey, boss! Scavenger is so hip, you know? We simply must go there! They've got the hottest things and the oiliest drinks! Let's split these cities like Moses and get there as fast as we can. Hey, I'm gonna let out the loudest fart known to man, right in at the Lapa Jones's pleasure dome. He even has his own catchphrase, and the scary thing is that it actually kind of works here. Whoa, the hell with that? Oh, the hell with it. Hell with cops. Hell with suit. He gave one hell of a performance and is without question one of the high points of the game's dialogue, delivering much of the game's best quips. Then let's do it! Better a terrible end than unending terror! You're a real poet, dopamine harp. Yeah! I drink words and fart rhymes! Woohoo! Going back to IMDB real quick, Boston was played by a fellow who was actually in Stan Lee's Malcolm X, some Law & Order episodes, and even Ghost Rider of all things. Unfortunately, Aquinox was his last listed role, and he passed away shortly after the game was released. A damn shame taken way too soon. Another notable wing is Sobinoso Chaka, a very interesting character because she's written knowing she's descended from the Dogon people of Mali. This is especially unique because after hundreds of years trapped underwater together, most aqua denizens seem to have completely disconnected from their surface roots. That said, I definitely can't speak to the accuracy of their portrayal of Dogon culture, sayings, and whatnot, but it is interesting they tried. Now, the other three wings are admittedly less memorable, but they still help round out the team. Lieutenant Lisa Bonham has a plan. I've got a plan. I've got a plan. Did you know Jatun Kocha is a surface language word meaning the sea? My little Lisa, full of knowledge nobody needs. When people complain about Aquinox's voice acting, they're probably thinking of Lisa, which Okay, sure, can sound a bit grating and unnatural at times, but I don't think it's the kiss of death to the game that some people seem to think it is. Certainly games of this era are no stranger to such, uh, fishy performances. I spill my drink! Captain Eliza de Grange is something of the mom of the group. Very straight-laced, prim and proper, one can't help but wonder what she gets out of hanging around with this motley crew. She doesn't have very much characterization outside of being the foil, but she has a few moments. I think we should split up, Commander. Sally has come up with a plan. Pico and I take the left canyon, Lisa and Harper explore the area on the right, and Flint does whatever the hell he feels like, as usual. Pico, the kid brother of the crew, is there as well. On the other side, the lesser antagonists of the game might not have much in the way of character depth. But despite this, they too are rather memorable. Take Christina Lloyd here. She might be a quickly dispatched early game boss, but her insult game is second to none. The arrogant, disgusting, sick, muck eating, slime clapping freak! There won't be any lines on your dry black body when it hits the sea bottom! I'm gonna sell your organs on the black market and use your shrunken hat as a joystick! Her leader, Vanderwall, on the other hand, well, I'm not exactly sure what he's going for. A soft boy Dr. Evil, perhaps? Now, listen carefully, Flint. There will be no data. You know I'd back at this perfect. 
regardless of the consequences to her. But this data is too dangerous. You do not want this data. Believe me. And even if the oceans evaporate to the last drop, you will not get it. Meanwhile, the leader of the Crawlers, an enemy faction of sea cave dwelling monster people, Harkonnen, excuse me, Korhonen, real subtle there, guys, is similarly unhinged. We're going to overrun you like the breath of a demon, like black angels of fat decay. Your ridiculous houses, your pale tooth, your flattered bones. Everything will belong to us! The only villain of any meaningfully charged depth is Commodore Sewell, the technocratic New Line politician. And that depth is admittedly somewhat undercut by his actions not really making a whole lot of sense if you try to follow the thread. Regardless, at least he has something of an ideological bent, which is more than the other major factions who basically just want to kill everyone and take over the world can say, but not by much. Join with me, and we'll step on the surface together. We will control the numerous satellites that still exist. And he who controls the skies controls the world. Oh, and there's also Brewmeister. Can't forget Brewmeister. The gods of the deep sea must have sent you. I'm so drunk, I can't find my way to the crapper. There's no way I can talk on. There is Freaking pirates around the interest one China's Raiders. Do some. Not exactly the most empathetic portrayal of alcoholism. He, like Harper, even has his own catchphrase, which, well. Honky Tong! Honky Tong! Honky Tong! Maybe it makes sense in the original German? So the story kicks off with Big Shot mercenary Flint losing his prized combat submarine having you work your way up from the murky depths in a leaky tub armed with a pea shooter. The game has Flint working his way across Aqua, from the relative peace of the Argentine basin, to the shining habitats of Neapolis, to the rough and tumble of the so-called Tornado Zone, fighting a variety of different factions along the way. First, I want to mention the Borg, I excuse me, the Bionts, a cybernetic, nano, biomechanical kind of civilization you fight them in a few missions. While they are set up in many ways to be the overall antagonists of the story, the game isn't really about them at all, until the final cutscene's sequel hook. A hook that is definitely not paid off in the sequel, but more on that later. Enigmatically, the Bions don't ever communicate with you, the player, leaving their motive something of a mystery in pretty much the same way as the Shivens from the Free Space series. Somewhat more explicable are the cannibalistic crawlers, led by the aforementioned Korhonen. They just want to take over Aqua and eat people. Their ships have a poisonous green aura about them, often described as floating scrap heaps. There are also eldritch squids, because why not? It's not really explained in the course of the game where they came from, that I could tell anyway. They definitely pack a punch, and the smaller ones are very difficult to hit in motion. You also fight a variety of normie humans over the course of the game, most of which being pirate gangs or other generally whacked out types, chief among them being Commodore Sewell, who is the main focus of the story. Now in the beginning, Sewell is just your average Atlantic Federation commander, though considerably smarmier than your friend and mentor, Admiral Cox. Sewell's objective in the beginning of the game is to complete the mysterious Brainfire project. You help him do this by securing data from a pirate gang and defending the Brainfire platform from wave after wave of attackers. Now, turns out, Sewell's intentions are noticeably less than pure, and Admiral Cox attempts to cut him off at the knees by taking over the government back in Neopolis. However, you, not knowing Sewell's endgame, assist him in stopping your friend and mentor from January 6thing Despite promising to spare Cox, Sewell slays him before your very eyes, before fleeing back to the Brainfire Project in the Tornado Zone. 
After all this, it turns out that Brainfire's entire aim, instead of being to connect to a satellite to get pictures of what remains of the surface world, was actually to connect to an Akira-style space laser satellite called Milstar X5. Sewell fires the laser, doing terrible, terrible implied damage to the world, igniting a firestorm and causing tectonic devastation. I say implied here because while this is a very cool and interesting cutscene, it honestly doesn't seem to affect much of anything in the missions after. Unless the implication is that this is what woke up the Eldritch Squids, which, granted, might be the case, but I don't think it was ever said directly. Regardless, you eventually send Sewell to Davy Jones' locker, turning your attention afterward to the emerging crawler and squid threats. The game ends with you defeating the giant eldritch squid which ate Corhonan, and then in the cutscene afterwards, the Bions absorb said squid and Corhonan as well, gaining all their knowledge and power. This feels like an interesting escalation of threat, and it's a shame this has never paid off in the game, nor its sequel. Perhaps the intention was for this to be the setup for the final chapter of the game, fighting the newly empowered Bions, and they just ran out of money. Who knows? Anyway, that's the overarching story, though again, I think the best parts of the story are the smaller character moments, as well as the overall fun, airy tone of the game, despite its darker moments. Adding to that tone significantly is the game's music. Surprisingly, some people mention not liking the music, but I'm definitely into it. Maybe it's just a childhood nostalgia thing for me, but I still think this part slaps. I definitely think the music is an iconic part of the experience, though one wishes they had included a few more tracks. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense to be listening to the Bayant theme song, Cloud of Terror, when fighting pirates, squids, or what have you. Regardless, still pretty grand, though I wouldn't blame anyone for turning it off who wasn't into it. Oh, and I definitely love the sound that plays upon loading into a station. It's a small thing, but it adds a nice, mysterious feeling. Maybe I'm just a sucker for any sound effect with a sustained tone. Also on the note of sound, I have to mention the voice acting again, which while I maintain a lot of it is transcendentally great, some of it's not so much. In addition to my issues with the sound mixing and the dialogue sequences, I'll also say the overall in-mission soundscape is not without its issues either. Maybe this is just modern hardware not playing great with the sound card requiring era of software, but the explosions really tend to blow out everything else, as explosions are pretty much constant when playing through missions. No sound effects rise to the level of Free Space 2's beam lasers, regrettably. Even still, the in-mission radio chatter can be pretty great, if you can hear it. Wait, Gotham is now completely without communications. They can't even order a pizza. Now the actual submarine combat itself is alright enough, though it's not exactly the most dynamic, mostly consisting of you trying to blast enemies while you and they strafe around. There's a mix of hitscan weapons and weapons of travel time. And it does admittedly feel pretty good to successfully land hits on targets by leading them right. Notably, games like Freelancer would later pioneer using a lead target reticle to denote where to shoot, taking much of the guesswork out, which is now largely the standard of modern flight combat sims. Oh, also, this being underwater, you don't have missiles, you have torpedoes. There's a wide variety to use, though I personally didn't find much use for them outside of fights with larger vessels. You yourself can be targeted by torpedoes as well, requiring you to drop a buzzer to break their target lock. 
I'd also like to note the in-mission HUD here, specifically the sonar mini-map, which is honestly pretty incredible in its accuracy, displaying much of the level geometry, complete with matching rotation. This could not have been easy with 2000's era technology. All in all, the combat is serviceable enough even in contemporary times, though an annoying amount of it does admittedly boil down to fighting face to face with a strafing enemy, face tanking their shots while they face tank yours. The real problem is in the mission objectives. Now, I get having escort missions, you are a mercenary after all, and the people of Aqua definitely need protection, but the escort missions of Aquinox are fatally flawed in a few different key ways. To start, your escort targets are basically made of cardboard, rapidly losing health to any amount of sustained fire or god forbid a torpedo. Second, in a good many missions, anytime you blow up an enemy, another one immediately spawns in. This actively disincentivizes you from actually blowing anybody up, instead focusing on managing their aggro, keeping them targeting you while you wait for a timer to finish. Which, well, frankly, isn't what I, nor probably most people, were looking for in the combat. These two issues taken together, well, it can lead to a lot of... Still worth suffering through for the story, I'll grant though I wouldn't fault anybody for turning down the difficulty on these sections, to the extent that even helps. Anyway, as noted, the best parts of the game take place between missions, in the conversations with various Aqua denizens. And just take a look at this glorious original Xbox green menu interface. No mouse interactivity either, the taint of the dread early 2000s consolization. This legitimately makes me wonder if they were trying for a console version of the game, but it never came together. Which is known to have happened to the sequel. Which would be a damn shame, because had this game been released on the original Xbox, I'm fairly confident it would have been well received, perhaps even a cult classic. Surprisingly, these kinds of games can work just fine on console. Look at Jedi Starfighter, for example. In addition to yakking with people, traveling to new places, and going on missions, you can also buy new equipment and subs in this interface. Notably, there's no equipment degradation or even penalty for reselling, so you can experiment a good deal for each mission. You can only bring two guns per mission, however, but you can find pretty quickly what works from the relatively few guns in the game. The subs are pretty direct line of upgrades too, for the most part. Oh, and totally random, but the best sub in the game, the one featured on the game's box and manual, looks something like the Beat Blaster from the original Amplitude, if anyone's played that. Now while Aquinox has survived the test of time in a lot of ways, there are some pretty big caveats I've been omitting, and you should probably know about them before slapping down the full five dollars or whatever it's going for on Steam these days. To start, Aquinox does not play well with modern gaming mice. What do I mean by this? Well, basically, modern mice apparently have a much, much higher rate at which they report their position back to the computer than the mice of Aquinox's era. So fast that the game legitimately cannot process it. Fortunately, rather than having to dig out a more modest mouse to float on with, you can actually turn down the reporting rate and sensitivity in G-Hub by making a profile specifically for the game that activates any time it's up. I imagine there's probably a Corsair equivalent for this kind of thing too, but whichever the case, thank you Logitech. With these mouse settings, along with some configuration file tweaks, you should be up and running pretty quick. I'd love to say the issues end there, but there's also some rather bad mission scripting errors in a few places. Admittedly, most missions worked fine, I only needed to restart them once each, but it really takes the wind out of your sails to encounter them. For example, this mission, where it seems like because I arrived at a waypoint before my wingmates, the scripting bugs out completely and the mission can't continue. Or this other mission, escorting the Brainfire buoy, where it just stops moving somehow, requiring another restart. There's even this one mission that consistently crashes to desktop upon finishing the intro cutscene. I was able to get it working through the old PC gaming trick of fiddling with the resolution and graphics settings until it worked. Something that I'm very glad current generations of PC gamers don't have to worry about anymore. 
The mission was a real slog too, with a seven or so minute long defense section with respawning enemies at the end. Amusingly, sometimes these bugs can actually be to your advantage. I'm pretty sure it's how I beat the game's legendarily bullshit final mission, where essentially all of the issues of the game compound on each other, particularly the infinitely respawning enemies. I'm pretty sure the escort targets I was supposed to be defending died horribly, and then even the power plant I was supposed to be defending seemingly died early too. But you know what? That's okay with me. I was never able to beat it as a kid, and reading people's experiences with it online, most other people straight up weren't able to beat it either. These bugs persist even on the final patched version on Steam by the looks of it. So it's definitely worth pointing out that Aquinox is a direct sequel to 1996's Archimedean Dynasty, or as it's known in Germany, Scheiße Fart, which translates to silent but deadly. Uh, excuse me, I mean silent running. Which honestly might have been more succinct, but I suppose they didn't want any confusion with the 70s movie of the same name. I picked it up on GOG, and I've gotta say, I'm very impressed with some of its graphics for the time. Definitely some interesting world building, too. Unfortunately, I cannot handle the combat gameplay. Not trying to disrespect it, heaven forbid, and there was a time in my life where I actually did play these kinds of games without mouse look, but I can't unring that bell. The arrow keys just don't cut it anymore. Lord almighty, if ever there's a game worthy of remaking and modernizing though, Archimedean Dynasty is it. Now, Aquinox 2. Well, let me start with this. If you click the I on the main menu, it does this. <laughs> Incidentally, this also serves as my review for Aquinox 2. To be more specific though, everything I liked, all the personality of Aquinox is gone. No Sally, nor any other interesting characters to speak of. They brought back the animated rooms from Archimedean Dynasty, which was a nice touch, but nobody in them has anything of interest to say at all. The color has both metaphorically and literally been drained from it. The graphics have been thoroughly muddied to the accursed next-gen brown of the day. The new art style of the portraits feel like traced photographs of famous people. But this guy, William Drake, stellar naming as always, is completely rudderless through much of the game, lacking any meaningful agency, just doing the missions others set up for him. And the missions? Well, I'll give them a little credit, the mission design is a little more dynamic, and the optional objectives are a little more explicit. But even here, the blandness seeps through. If you target a crawler or a pirate, you get the same standard pilot image and voice letting you know that you've targeted them. Riveting. There's even one mission which, no way in hell am I playing all the way through Aquinox 2 a second time to get footage for this, but it's a gigantic pitch black maze building that you have to navigate your way through with little in the way of markers, just 3D wall level geometry all over the place. If you've played it, you know the one. I get they were probably going for a Descent vibe or something, but just no, not, not like this. And to top it all off, they ruined Atwelpa Jones. Just listen to him now. Hey, Sport! What are you staring at? Oh, excuse me. Do you know... I thought I could earn some money. What? Ooh, sure. I am the best here, Sport. The good guys and the bad guys all meet with me. And if you ever feel like floating around, Atawapa Jones is the master of manipulating brain chemistry. Just who the heck is this Doctor Who sounding weirdo? That's not my Atawapa. Tragedy. Absolute tragedy. But wait, Aquinox 2 is not the only sequel anymore. Now there's the kickstarted Aquinox Deep Descent. Heh, <laughs> I see what you did there. Which dropped in 2020. Though I wish I had better news to report, but reviews do not look good. It was noble of them to try, with their Kickstarter only taking in a measly 95,000 above their 75,000 goal. At least they shipped something, which is more than a lot of Kickstarters can say. I might try it someday, but life's too short to play mediocre games. Ah shit, come on, it wasn't that bad. In conclusion, Aquinox, despite its flaws, is a rare pearl of a game. 
Treat it in game terms like you would a strangely translated art house film from Europe, and you may have a grand time indeed. It's currently the best way I know to experience the setting of Aqua, a setting very worthy of exploration. One almost wishes for a more open freelancer, or even God knows EVE Online style of game set in Aqua. I'd much rather play that than the seeming wasted potential of the sequels. Or, again, just remake Archimedean Dynasty, please. So, should you buy it? Maybe. If you're interested in the setting. On a purely mechanical basis, you're probably much better off playing Free Space 2, with its fan-upgraded graphics and mod campaigns. Or even something like Everspace, which scratches the space combat itch with a roguelite twist. It's regrettable that space combat sims aren't more popular and known, but they still exist, and there are some damn good ones out there. And perhaps someday we'll get one that does the world of Aqua justice.